Hello, everyone. I'm going to start this session with a sound check, given the technical difficulties that we were having before. So if one of the panelists could just send me a message to confirm that you can hear me and see me before I launch into our next session. Fantastic. Thank you all. It's so nice to be back with you now for our final session of our workshop on gender and politics in South Asia. In this session, we're going to be considering the political behavior of women in South Asia, and in particular, not just how they vote, but what they do between elections. And we have three fantastic papers to be discussed with you and a fantastic chair to organize the discussion. So with that, I'm going to ask G Gabrielle Crooks-Wisner to take the stage. Gabrielle is an assistant professor at the University of Virginia and does work on political participation in India, as well as the intersection of political participation and the provision of public services. And I encourage you to look up all of her work. Um, it's really wonderful to have her with us here today. And Gabrielle, I'm gonna turn it over to you now to introduce the panel. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you from many different time zones. Um, it's really an absolute pleasure to be here today to, to moderate this last panel. I want to thank Jennifer for the invitation. I've learned so much over the last couple of days from the discussion, and I'm looking forward to the conversation today. So congratulations to Jennifer and Punita and everyone who's organized this, this wonderful event. Um, as Jennifer said, our theme for today is uh, women between the votes. So this is really pushing us to look between and beyond elections to other arenas of political life um, from the perspective of women, both as citizens, but also women as elected representatives. So looking at the day to day spaces for mobilization and participation and also at the kind of everyday job of, of governing. So we have three papers that will look at different dimensions of this. Um, each speaker will have 12 minutes, um, and then we'll use the remaining of our about amount of time for the Q&A. Um, as before, I'll ask you to please put your questions for the panelists in the Q&A function. Uh, please indicate who your question is for when you type a question, and then I will collate those questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Of course, we're a large group and short on time, so we may not get to all of them, and so I invite the the panelists to also answer some of those questions um, using the Q&A as we go along. So without further ado, um, our first paper today um, has a fantastic title, Seeing Like a State or Seeing the State, a Qualitative Study of a Government Program to Support Women's Self-Help Groups in Madhya Pradesh. It's presented today by Surili Shipp, who is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Um, and her co-authors are here too, um, Nevdita Narain, Arandita Bajdeo, and Michael Walton. Um, so, Sujali, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right. Um, how's this looking? Looks good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, so thanks so much to Jennifer, Bonita, and Gabrielle for you know organizing and running this panel. And I'm really grateful and humbled to be here and get the chance to present um, this work. Um, and just overall very excited about having um, you know the inauguration of CCI um, here with Jennifer at the helm um, and about the theme of this inaugural workshop. Um, so I really just wanted to preface that this project is um, a large team effort and um, and an and an evolving one um, as we keep kind of refining our questions through discussions um, and um, analysis of the of the transcripts that we have um, over the last couple of years. And so Arundita, Nivedita, and Michael are um, also here. And um, Nivedita and Arundita have um, actually been based in Delhi. And I just wanted to say I'm quite humbled by um, by how they've worked on this paper um, during the pandemic situation over the last weeks. Um, and finally, I wanted to say that I, it wouldn't have been possible without our team of interviewers and really intensive discussions with them. Um, they're from um, the Institute of Social Studies um, Trust um, and Arundita, who you can see here, um, was also in the field um, for this work. So. Um, I want to start with um, our kind of broad puzzle. We were in, originally given sort of an empirical puzzle to address. Um, so um, by, by our funder and, and we were tasked with kind of figuring out why women's self-help groups, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, but if you were there in yesterday's panel, um, the kind of um, 
co uh, concept was introduced. Um, but um, our, our question was originally, why were self-help groups going defunct at a high rate in the state of Madhya Pradesh? Um, uh, from kind of a seven statewide quantitative um, evaluation of NR of um, self help groups. Um, however, during and after engaging with the actors in the SHG ecosystem, um, we saw the defunctness and functionality are not quite as binary as they seem, and um, they're internally defined. Um, and so our questions actually became how do state bureaucratic structures interact to deliver program services um, and to create and sustain local institution, new local institutions. Um, and we wanted to ask, you know, can a structural analysis really help us to understand um, failure better? So um, our argument here is really um, that um, some arguments that we're going to make here are that it is important to distinguish between government and NGO mobilized local institutions in evaluating how self-help groups work. Um, when there are certain substantive tensions in the design of the government program that implements um, self-help groups, then structural incentives become an especially important scope condition for how the program functions. And we'll describe um, a little of that here, um, what the that scope condition looks like. Um, and um, third, that you know, incentives from above can perpetuate and per the precise social inequalities that they're meant to be overturning. And so in the program that we examine here in particular in the context of NRLM as implemented um, in the district that we look at in MP, there's an inherent tension um, between the goal of transforming social structures um, and tapping into existing hierarchies to deliver program benefits. Um, and, you know, that's been documented to happen differently um, in a lot of the other literature in other states, and that's why we thought it was especially important to study it, um, um, given what was happening um, in this context. Um, so we think that, you know, our, some of the contributions here are um, first about understanding failure. Um, and so much of the, you know, literature on self-help groups um, really focuses on the successes. Um, but second of all, you know, I think the, the big, um, uh, highlight that we bring in or what we focus on is taking implementing structures really seriously in evaluating self-help groups um, in making this distinction between government and NGO mobilization um, of self-help groups. Um, and, um, you know, when the state is involved, just forming groups may not translate to collective voice um, is kind of um, an assumption that we, you know, a black box that we kind of dig into a little bit more. Um, and through through the structural analysis. Um, another contribution is, is thinking about the fact that different um, processes and structures are needed for different goals. In particular, we think about um, service delivery, the approach to SHGs as service delivery platforms um, versus, you know, as, um, you know, a project that aim or a program that aims to build autonomous local institutions for marginalized women's collective voices. Um, and finally, you know, we really highlight um, key actors here um, to study further um, that we think would be important to study further um, in kind of wider and other studies of self-help groups, uh, government mobilized self-help groups. So um, for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, National Rural Livelihoods Mission, which is the government program we're talking about here. Um, then kind of discuss some of the um, existing research on um, self-help groups um, and our theoretical lenses. Um, and then finally, I'm going to kind of lay out um, what our sample looks like, what methods we used, um, and highlight some of our findings in relation to the tensions that we found um, inherent in the program's design and how they kind of really come out in the implementation structure and the incentives um, of the actors um, who we interviewed um, of the in the SHG bureaucracy. Um, and finally, I'll kind of highlight a few takeaways um, uh, for, for research and policy. So the National Rural Livelihoods Mission um, is a government initiative. You know, it's really the cornerstone um, of, um, it's really a cornerstone of the gender um, equality kind of um, implementation through development programs um, of the national government, but it's implemented through um, state missions. And um, its goals are kind of about both um, income and enhancement, um, as well as empowerment of especially poor and socially marginalized uh, rural women. 
Um, and what it does is it forms, um, it mobilizes self-help groups that are largely structured around savings and loans um, for women. They're groups of 10 to 12 women in our context. Um, and then these are later supposed to be federated into village organizations, and those village organizations are then federated into cluster level um, federations. So it's this really, you know, establishing a new hierarchy of local institutions. Um, and it's really quite a vast and multi level bureaucracy down to the frontline actors. And that's really what we'll kind of um, dig into here um, with kind of a vision um, of these federations as institutions of the poor um, that would even take over some functions of the state bureaucracy. Um, and currently there have been approximately 7 million NRLM um, SHGs that have been formed um, across the country according to their, um, their online portal. So um, some, exist some existing research on um, SHGs that we looked into to understand how to structure our study about why SHGs were going defunct initially um, were kind of systematic reviews, which often focused on um, quanti uh, excuse me, on um, quantitative, quantitative studies and program delivery outcomes. Um, and often didn't um, necessarily um, distinguish between government and NGO mobilization or hone in on the structures, how they're structurally different when um, self-help groups are mobilized um, in these different ways. Um, we also kind of looked at explanations for success and mechanisms of success. And, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's been kind of research that shows um, positive average correlations um, between SHG membership and things like household productive assets, um, household expenditures on education, um, and even, you know, enhanced women's confidence on engagement with the community. Um, and I think, you know, some of the, um, uh, single studies on, on specific areas or programs or qualitative work has also shown, um, for example, um, a lot of success in uh, NGO mobilized SHGs for in, in our same state in Madhya Pradesh, um, for example, so the preliminary work um, talks about um, how um, self-help groups in Madhya Pradesh were expanding women's social networks um, and women are attending Gram Sabhas more. We, um, we also have some evidence about that in uh, Tamil Nadu as well as in um, a government program in Bihar. And so, you know, but, but those kind of, um, we found less of a focus on really being able to grapple with the causes of institutional defunctness of these institutions and functionality. Um, and that's where I was saying, you know, we realized that this question that we were asking or, or was and studying was really um, one where the outcome was kind of internally defined by the program itself. And so this is what kind of led us to kind of take a step back and think about um, how the program design and implementation was actually working um, within an interacting multi-level um, bureaucracy. Um, and so we started to look at applications of state functioning um, and bureaucratic overload um, and how to think about the incentives of the actors um, in the system. Um, and so um, what this kind of um, shows you is, you know, our approach to thinking about how incentives from above interact with the precise kind of um, motivations and incentives um, of these actors. So um, one approach to thinking about this concerns the incentives of individual actors, which is this, um, you know, third box here. Um, and this, on, this, on the side of the state, we kind of started to think about it as a series of principal agent problems that the government faces here conceived of as kind of lower levels of government being the agents of the intentions of higher levels of governments, um, which is in turn shaped by the institutional structures um, and where, where each of these actors is really located um, in the institutions. Um, we also thought, you know, this actually works also in a parallel um, fashion to interpreting the behavior of citizens who are often, um, you know, in this case, women um, from oppressed castes or Adivasi groups um, and thinking about them and uh, their incentives um, for how they participate and see um, the structure of the SHG system and what they can get out of it in terms of benefits and costs um, of joining the group. Um, and, and so um, I'm not going to go into too much more here, but we essentially kind of look at a couple of different data sources. Um, one is really texts of the programs um, 
guidelines, um, which there are extensive, you know, guidelines for anyone that's worked on, you know, large uh, government um, programs in India, you know, the all the documentation um, that's available. And so we really took that seriously to look at what the intentions of the program were um, and how it structured incentives for the bureaucrats within it. Um, and then we, we did our qualitative data collection. Um, so this is kind of just a quick, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, except to say that this is the structure within which uh, we um, selected and snowball sampled um, actors to interview at the national level, the state level, district and block level, and then at the village level with the, the institutions and the federations, um, with SHG groups kind of forming the focal point at which we started. Um, and snowballed up to figure out who all the other actum, actors in the system were. Um, and I'm actually going to skip a couple of these. So um, the context of our study is a district in Madhya Pradesh. Um, and uh, we used a, qualitative, a quantitative data set to sample from, which already had labeled whether SHGs were defunct or um, functional. Um, and what we saw was that defunctness was not clustered in one area and um, functionality and defunctness happened within um, really close geographical proximity. So that really informed how we um, sampled the self-help groups to look at. And so what we did was um, actually selected um, purposively six self-help groups um, characterized, uh, three were characterized as functional, three were defunct in the data set. Um, and we also wanted to um, vary the linkages that they had to the federations. So you can see that some of the self-help groups were um, linked to um, federations of VOs um, and CLFs and others others were not. So um, we have about two minutes remaining, just so you know. Okay, sounds good, thank you. So, um, so we, as I said, we looked at the texts of the state um, we had about 90 interviews and um, six focus group discussions. Um, and the ways, uh, and I think I'm going to skip this slide given the time that I have. Um, so to kind of get to what our key findings were, um, when we looked at the, um, the texts of the NRLM program, we kind of found a few key tensions. Um, uh, first between kind of a top-down engineering or delivery approach um, versus building institutions. Um, second, between working with community hierarchies as they are now um, versus mobilizing groups to really transform a power relationships. Um, third, in reproducing the state's functions versus creating autonomous local institutions. And then fourth, um, on universal inclusion with a blueprint kind of approach versus letting institutions fail. Um, and, you know, um, I think, you know, our, um, so this is kind of really an example of that, you know, one of the documents um, says the SHGs, the federations, increase our voice, space, bargaining power, changes of, of policies in our favor is how they're kind of viewed. Another document talks about implementation in a mission mode, focusing on targets, outcomes, and time-bound delivery, um, which you can see really, you know, um, shows this tension quite well. Um, we also saw this tension um, in, in, in the ways that incentives and motivations were described by the actors. Um, so um, some of how they described their roles, the frontline kind of bureaucrats described their roles in terms of targets, universal inclusion, you know, um, not in a demand driven way. Um, and frontline workers who are kind of the next, the most frontline um, of the bureaucracy uh, they're called community resource persons, really depend on the salary and they work extra days, but at the same time, they don't, um, and they come from the communities and are, are SHG members themselves. Um, but at the same time, they, um, we found that, you know, they are not representative bureaucrats in the sense that we would think of um, them really representing demands and kind of, you um, uh, putting them up the state hierarchy to kind of make it a responsive program. So they're really elites in the local communities um, and often they amplify existing um, local hierarchies by taking over a lot of the leadership positions um, in our sample. Um, and I'm going to skip over this last part. Um, our paper has a lot more on some of the other actors, but I wanted to just end on um, a reframing of actually a, the provocative question that I think um, Soledad asked in yesterday's panel, which is, 
you know, um, what's the relationship between um, development and women's agency? It's often thought of as development leading to women's agency. Um, and maybe there's a reverse directionality actually here, but our kind of um, project I think speaks to a reframing on how can the state really support women's agency and what aspects of development programs can actually fail to support it. Um, and so we think that a development program that works through multi-level bureaucracy and local institutions must understand how to structure incentives within a complex interacting system. And the state may be a part of helping to create spaces for expanding agency of socially disadvantaged women's agency, but perverse incentives due to the interaction of the state's own internal logic and structures um, also, also exist and need to be considered um, in, in policy. So um, I'll end there, um, thanks. Oh, thank you so much. This is an incredibly rich project, and that's definitely a provocative question that you leave us with at the end. Um, so thank you so much. And if anyone has questions about this presentation, you can um, type them in the Q&A and we'll turn to them um, at, the, at the end of our time. Our, our second paper today um, is titled, Who's Watching? Observer Effects in Public Opinion Research. And this will be presented by uh, Adam Heider, who is an assistant professor in political science and environmental studies at the College of Worcester. Um, and her co-author on this, who I don't think is with us today, is uh, Irfan Nuruddin. So Adam, the floor is yours. All right, let's see if this works. Um, you can hear me OK, and you can see my screen. Perfect. Yes, on both, yeah. Perfect, thank you. OK, so thank you, Gabby, and thank you to Jennifer and CCI at Berkeley, and congratulations on a great first uh, conference. I'm looking forward to the subsequent ones. Um, you know, women's political participation has received a lot of attention in recent years, and especially at this panel, we've been talking a lot about um, female participation in politics um, and overt forms of um, political action, such as voting. Um, women's entry into politics as candidates and voters has achieved some successes in improving women's access to politics, particularly in India, but persistent barriers remain. I think one of the themes to this conference has been these two sort of uh, tensions, right? On the one hand, we're seeing these improvements of women in positions of power and in representation, but at the local level, at the household level, women may not be entering or participating in politics as much as we would like still. And nearly all these barriers have to do with how how women are viewed as political actors by the state, by political parties, but mostly by the family itself, right? So the intra-household politics has received a lot of attention lately, and that's something we want to focus our energies on today. And so we start by posing a really simple puzzle. Women's voting in India, and this paper focuses uh, specifically on India, has gone up, has only gone up in recent years, and it's kind of been at par with men's voting. But when we ask women in large end surveys that are conducted regularly by the Lokniti NES or by other nationally representative surveys, we ask women, are you interested in politics? The answer comes back, uh, not really, maybe. And it lags behind the political interest that's expressed by men. And to that, for, that was kind of a puzzle to me. So I, I started this project with Irfan when I was sort of in my first year of graduate school and it's kind of evolved since then. And the one thing that really struck me is the disparity between being a participant in voting and then not really feeling the need or the ability to express that you're interested in politics. So what is this about interest that women are somehow lagging behind their male peers when they're asked in the survey context? And what can it tell us about intra-household dynamics? So I ask, are women less likely to be interested in politics? And I look at a lot of literature from across the world on this. Um, we found that you know, a, a, a public opinion surveys in sort of the 60s and 70s in the United States said that yes, indeed, women are more likely to use don't know and neither agree nor disagree responses, right? So these non-substantive responses are more likely to come up with female participants. In more recent work um, in the developing world, Lupo and Michelich do a survey of experts and they find that female respondents have trouble discussing politics. So is this a knowledge issue, right? Are women just less knowledgeable about politics. Um, this is even when accounting for income and education, right? So this is a study from, um, from Europe doing the, their version of the Eurobarometer, right? That women are sort of less likely to just be well informed about politics, uh, even when you account for their income and education. We also found that they're less likely to guess, right? So maybe it's just that nobody knows 
but men are more likely to just hazard a guess and say, yeah, I do know about this issue. And whereas women are more likely to be risk averse, right? And we've just seen this in a, in a discussion, uh, in, in the previous discussion as well. And I think Francesca's paper is also sort of addressing women's aversion to risk when it comes to these political situations. But this is happening within the survey context as well, which I personally consider very benign, but it can be an important sort of indication of how women think about themselves as political uh, actors and beings. Maybe it's that they have different kinds of knowledge, right? Maybe they're more informed about local politics. So this is another study that's done in Europe. We know from work in India and South Asia in general that women prioritize different things. So it's not like they don't have distinct political preferences. They're just less likely to express them. And that's something that's sort of puzzling. They play central roles in bargaining and claim making. This is work that's done by um, you know, the moderator here as well. Um, but they're doing it often on behalf of the household. Right? So this is sort of central, the, key, this, the intra-household dynamic of this is central to understand. We turn then to feminist literature out of India and elsewhere. We suggest, we find that the household is not an altruistic space. And this is just as true for something as seemingly benign as an opinion survey, someone coming to your household and asking you what your opinion is on politics as any other kind of uh, aspect of your life. Women's political opinions might be actively discouraged. We've seen this in Pakistan in particular. There's been a lot of studies overtly asking men if they think women should vote differently from them or if they, they think they can discuss politics, right? So this was the study that was done by Chima et al, just asking men, is it appropriate for women to be discussing politics? But this comes out in subtle ways in anthropological literature and feminist literature as well. Should women really be interested in politics and who's defining those rules? even if their vote is required, right? So that's the key part. So women are still expected and valued as voters because it does something for the household. It helps them bargain their position with the state. But whether or not they should have an informed, independent opinions about it might be contested. We know that privacy is a luxury and it's likely to be less available to those who are poorer, less educated and live in villages. What we are suggesting in this paper is that privacy is less available to women in spite of many of these controls, right? So controlling for education and for income and for location, there's something about being a woman in South Asia that makes it less likely that people will just leave you alone when it comes to you answering surveys and voicing political opinions. And this is fairly intuitive for those who have done work uh, in South Asia as well, who know that when we show up at a household, people get very curious, especially if you're trying to speak to the women about what it is this is about, right? So we've talked a lot about, a lot about male gatekeepers and so forth, and this is sort of one way of, of uh, sort of digging into that. And um, we, so the, the bulk of this survey, is, uh, the, the bulk of this paper is going to focus on three surveys from India, but I wanted to pull up the Afrobarometer study that we found um, from 2015 for comparison. Um, as you can see from the columns that look at women, these are, these are basically questions at the end of the survey that ask the enumerator to detail who else was in the room at the time, right? And this is now becoming a standard in many of these large end surveys. Um, and so these are some of the surveys that we found that do enumerate this, um, this feature. Um, and what we found is lo and behold, you know, uh, women are just le more likely to be observed, right? They're less likely to have that privacy. Um, and I'll go a little you know, further into what the breakdown of this looks like. So um, using three surveys from India and using a, a range of um, controls as well, we looked at what is it that you know, determines the likelihood of you being given privacy. And sure enough, being a woman um, really does increase your likelihood of having somebody else around um, while you're answering surveys, right? And so something I just wanna note here is that even things like education, although are strongly significant, they're all, not always significant in the same direction, right? And I had to check this multiple times just to make sure it was quoted correctly, but it turns out that a lot, you know, even while controlling for a lot of things like income and location, there's something specific about being a woman that makes it less likely that you would be given privacy during surveys. Um, and so you can look at further breakdowns of this um, just very quickly. It's you're more likely to be observed by other adults from within the household um, and in some cases um, by your neighbors, but men are more likely to be seen by, with sort of small crowds of people around them. Okay, and again, this is intuitive for those who've done fieldwork in South Asia. 
Okay, so this is our theoretical framework. We think that women's political opinions are discouraged even if their vote is required. Um, we think this is gonna apply more to certain questions. So for example, current affairs, minority rights, state of the country, these kind of general political opinions. We do think that there's something about party approval or that the government or Sarkar has done work for us that doesn't get, you know, does, doesn't elicit a dampening of responses, right? So it still encourages people to say something, but it's less likely to be that women just say, no, we don't have an opinion about this. We think the type of question matters, right? And I'm happy to talk about this more. We are not predicting directionality. So we don't think we have an idea of what each household's particular taboos are or what direction they go in. We're just saying across, across South Asia and particularly in India, the fact of an opinion is what the problem is within the households. And so women are more likely to give non-substantive responses when asked for their opinion, right? Very simple claim. So our first two hypotheses in the paper look at whether women are less likely to report an interest in politics if, if observed by family members and, and neighbors. Um, and the second set of hypotheses are that these, uh, the same sort of will not affect women's self-reporting of participation, or at least not in this consistent downward direction. There is an issue here. Women are more likely to use non-substantive responses and they're more likely to be observed. There's clearly endogeneity problems here. So we use matching methods which would match our female respondents on the same covariates that we are expecting will also affect their ability to answer um, fewer of these opinion questions, right? And so again, I'm happy to talk about this more, but it looks something like this. You basically create, you, you, run, the, you, you run a program that allows you to only look at women who are socioeconomically similar to each other, but one happened to have somebody else in the room at the time and the other didn't, right? And you create a balance, uh, you, you create sort of um, a frequency that would allow that person to be matched with others who are like her, but just didn't happen to have somebody else in the room. Um, so again, happy to talk about this more, but we do this sequentially for each survey, and then we run the um, run our OLS or logits with those weights um, sort of put in as well. So all that I'm showing you here from the paper is going to be having had a pre -ma a match sample. Okay, so this is what political interest opinions and the current affairs index look like. Political interest is simply, are you interested in politics? Political opinions and current affairs are a series of questions, right? So typically like five or seven questions in a cluster that say things like um, the government should support working class people or India should go to war with Pakistan or something like that. Just like ask the, a range of opinions. You try to cluster them so we get a sense of these are questions that are similar to each other. Um, and so you're seeing that having somebody else in the room, and this is 2009, definitely makes it less likely compared to the, the baseline, which is being alone, that the person will answer questions. And these are all going in the downward direction, right? I think that's something else we really noticed. So the next uh, survey that, and this is for men, by the way. So men don't seem to have the same effect. It's either null or they're somewhat more likely to answer questions if their children happen to be around. Um, this is the women's responses for um, 2014. We were a lot less likely to find people actually who had been interviewed on alone uh, and were women. So again, like matching doesn't always work perfectly, but you're still able to see some effect here with other adult family um, for women. Um, and for men, similarly, you know, they, they just don't answer any different, whether they're alone or in person. But for women, compared to being alone, if you're observed by an adult family member or your spouse or somebody else, at least in these ones, um, it seems to make you less likely that you'll either answer all the questions or just less likely to say that you're interested in politics, right? So these are, let's say, you know, a, a battery of 13 political opinion questions. You're actually likely to answer one or two fewer questions if your husband happens to be in the room or if you're being observed by neighbors. Um, and depending on your preference for you know, uh, uh, on significance, it, it sort of applies to the adult family as well. And this is the same for men. Okay, so this is a lot already, but we wanted to dig further into what kinds of questions that people are sort of not responding to, right? So we already have strong evidence that women alter their answers in the presence of adult family members. We find that the content of the question matters. So I wanted to tell you about party performance really quickly, right? 
Here's an earlier result that we found that went in the totally opposite direction. You have women much more likely to answer questions about party performance if their husbands or other adults are in the room, and then less likely if it's about current affairs. Why would that be? You dig into the content of the question and you see that this is also sort of part of that political performance, right? That it's asking you whether the party has done a good job or not. And so you might wanna think about what people are assuming about who's asking, who are the survey takers, right? Where is this person coming from? Gabby, how am I doing on time? You have about a minute remaining. Okay, perfect. So we have mixed evidence that participation is sanctioned in the same way, right? So I, I am gonna use a little time on this. So this is basically for voting, we don't, we simply don't see the same effects. We, some, of, some people are less likely to say they voted in the presence of family. Some are more likely to say they voted. It's just not as consistent. Um, and here's the same thing for participating in election campaigns for female respondents as well. So it's negative over here, but in front of a small crowd, they're more likely to say that they participated. We find that men face fewer pressures in the household when it comes to political opinion, and we can see that they will also have trouble answering uh, questions, but that it's just not the same as it is for, for women. I'm going to skip over this and sort of quickly conclude. So we use a measure of intra-household behavior, which is who's watching. Um, we find that women are more likely to express an interest in politics if given the privacy to do so, right? So this is the flip side of our finding is that if you leave women alone when they're taking surveys, they're actually likely to give you opinions on them. Um, you know, consistent with the theme of this conference, I think we find that political citizenship for women is deeply contested um, and that we want that it should be taken seriously in the context of survey research. So we really commend the effort of Lokniti and other surveys to um, include this who's watching question at the end. Um, and finally, we find that very small increases in educational attainment can make a difference for women expressing political opinions. And we think that's a, um, a net good. So I'll stop there and I'll, I'll leave the rest for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is so interesting and, and really uh, so important for all of us who do survey work. So thank you. Um, thank you. Great. So we have a, a, a final paper um, titled Time in Office and the Changing Gender Gap in Dishonesty, Evidence from Local Politics in India. And our presenter is Francesca Yusenius from the University of Oslo. Um, so Francesca, please take us away. Great, thank you so much, Gabby. Um, and uh, wonderful to see you all here. I'm really delighted to be almost with you in, uh, in Berkeley. I would have rather have been in Berkeley, of course, um, but it's wonderful that it's possible to do it um, online. I'm gonna to try to share my screen now. So let's see if I'm able to go to uh, full screen mode. Um, I wanted to see, can you see the uh, slides changing here? Yes. Wonderful. Um, wonderful. So this is co-authored work with uh, three colleagues uh, in economics, Ananis Chaudhry, Vegar Ivishn, and Pushka Metra. Um, and in this paper, we address a question that um, fascinated me, and I think also them for a long time, uh, this question about whether women are more or less corrupt than men when they enter politics. Um, and I mean, there are a bunch of good reasons to have women in politics. And I think the presentations we just had by Janet and Nina uh, are great examples of how, how women can be role models. Uh, and they, because of having different experiences in life, uh, might alter um, political discourses, policies, et cetera. Uh, but then often one goes quite far in so-called so instrumentalist reasons for why we should have women in politics including that we really should expect women to act differently and women will clean up politics and become uh, make it less corrupt. And that is a more controversial uh, topic and I'll get back to why it's, why it's controversial uh, and to sort of uh, uh, go ahead and say what we'll be arguing is that uh, we really shouldn't take it for granted that women are less corrupt. They might be so for a while, but as they learn the political game, we should sort of expect them to catch up and become more similar to male politicians in lots of ways. Um, but let me um, go a little bit first into um, this perception of women as cleaners of politics. This is a button from US politics of elect women clean up politics. 
Um, and from the Indian context, it's a wide held perception that women are less corrupt than men. Uh, this week, I saw wonderful work in this workshop by uh, by Bhumi Purohit, for example, that show that uh, BDOs, the, the bureaucrats that deal the most with uh, with politicians, have a clear perception that women are uh, uh, in politics are less corrupt than men. So this is widely held, and the policy implication of this belief are important. So, for example, here uh, we have a picture in a BBC story from Mexico, Estado de Mexico, a state in Mexico, where they decided to only appoint women to transit police because they wanted to clean up, uh, clean up politics and have fewer bribes. And there are similar stories from across the world. Um, then the question is, of course, is that because they were women or because it was a change, uh, an abrupt um, uh, change to the system where you brought in new people? If you look at um, uh, evidence from across the world, for example, uh, country level data, you see that there's a strong cross national correlation between the share of women in parliament and corruption. Um, and this is one of the reasons why people have concluded that there must be a relationship here. But as we know, correlation is not causation. And there are many other aspects of these countries that make them um, so that you, the, the relationship could be spurious in the sense that liberal democracies tend to be less corrupt and tend to be um, uh, more friendly to having more women included in politics. So it's hard to know what the causal relationship is. Um, um, so the findings in empirical studies are actually quite contradictory. So there are definitely studies that find and argue, similar to the one I, I showed above, that the, how if you have more women in parliament, you see lower corruption. Uh, there are also individual level studies that show that uh, women are more honest and less tolerant of corruption, uh, that people are less likely to be bribed, pay bribes in areas where women are in power, in power and so on. But there are a bunch of other studies that show no gender disparity in the propensity towards corrupt behavior and dishonesty. And then there are um, some studies uh, that try to reconcile contradictory findings, suggesting, for example, that the association between gender and corruption is spurious, uh, or that context matters, that the gender gap um, is larger in context with high electoral accountability because women are generally have been found to be uh, more scared of uh, taking bribes in high risk situations. And, and we totally agree that context is important. In addition to that, we should think, take into account experience and time. So our argument is related to experience and time in office um, and that uh, corruption, propensity towards corruption might change. And so our argument is that you should theorize the gender gap in dishonesty and corruption as dynamic or changing. So what are the mechanisms, what are the reasons why we should expect women to be less corrupt? Well, one big argument that I think um, comes quite intuitively to people um, is that women are uh, more pro-social and altruistic. And there are, is a bunch of evidence at many levels, including a lot of experimental evidence showing that women do tend to be more pro-social and altruistic. Um, and then there's also the argument that women are more risk averse than men, which has also been found in a lot of studies. Now, the fact that they're found in a lot of studies doesn't mean that they are inherent or essentialist. Uh, and a lot of gender scholars argue against the more essentialist um, interpretation of this, that this is just something women, women are born to be more pro-social or more caring. Um, I don't think one has settled completely on whether there is some biological element, but I think most would agree that at least a large part of gender gaps in behavior are because of experience and socialization. And if to the extent that we believe this is because of experience and socialization, uh, then we should expect these things to be changeable. Um, and we do have a bunch of studies suggesting that these things are changeable. So for example, there's a study from Zambia showing that men and women politicians who enter politics over time quite quickly start adhering to more to reciprocity norms, suggesting that they become more prone to corrupt behavior. Um, and then you have studies of risk aversion um, that show quite clearly that those who become more familiar with certain types of risks find them less frightening, and also that risk attitudes can change really rapidly within the span of a few weeks. So these things can change. So, Although we might expect um, women who enter politics because of different socialization and experience than men to act in a more risk averse or pro-social manner, 
uh, we should also expect that, that might change with time in office. So we have these two mechanisms, the pro-social mechanism, the risk aversion mechanism, and then we add on two more that we think are important based on existing literature. And these are mechanisms more clearly focused on change. So um, the third one we have is the political network mechanisms. There's a fair bit of literature showing that um, women uh, are less corrupt because they have less opportunity to do so because they have weaker political networks than men. Uh, but then we also know um, from, uh, among others, the work of Tona Shri Goyo, who also presented in the workshop this week, that women very rapidly build political networks once they are in power. So uh, they might be at a disadvantage for being corrupt when they enter office, but they can catch up and become better at it as they go along. Um, and then we also have um, what we call an aspirations mechanism or a time horizon mechanisms, because we know that politicians with a shorter time horizon tend to be more opportunistic. Um, and then we have the reality that women across the world, but especially in India, uh, face a more hostile environment. So, so we put it out there that it's possible that over time, therefore, women become less interested in staying in, in, in politics and men, given them a shorter time horizon and therefore an incentive to engage more in corrupt behavior. So um, what these four mechanisms point towards is um, an expectation that the gap in dishonesty that you might see as women enter office will shrink with time in office or even be reversed if they have uh, shorter time horizons or end up being treated so badly in politics that they get hardened. So, um, uh, however, it's more of an open empirical question how that, uh, how quickly that happens. So our study is from the eastern uh, state in India, West Bengal, as many of you know, a large state with about 90 million people. Our focus is on one of the districts, and um, that is North 24 Parganas, uh, which is the district with about 11 million um, people. In all of West Bengal, you have about 3,000 gram panchayats. That's um, village council. That's the local, most local level of elections in India. Um, and we uh, had hoped, I must say, to work across uh, West Bengal, but um, we worked in, uh, right around the time of the 2018 elections. And as some of you may remember, that was a lot of election violence and trouble uh, at the time. And so we ended up concentrating our study uh, to make sure that we did not interfere uh, in any problematic way in the uh, campaign or election process or uh, stuff afterwards. So we had, by staying in one area, we were much better able to control um, the impact of the study we were doing. But we selected um, 30 Grand Panchayas from across uh, the district and sampled 400 local level politicians um, to study in that area. Now, we wanted to look at what happened over time. And so our design was to select um, uh, in the same localities, incoming and outcoming politicians, thereby controlling for a lot of aspects of the political environment they were in. Also in West Bengal, there's about 50% reservations for women in politics. So about half of the incoming and half of the outgoing politicians were women. Let's see if I missed anything here. And so uh, we sampled these uh, politicians and um, gave them a large survey and also a, a set of, um, of behavioral experiments that are commonly used in economics to try to measure uh, the different aspects of our, our question, uh, questions that we had. And uh, measuring attitudes towards corruption is difficult, of course, because there's a lot of social desirability bias, potentially, if you ask questions directly. So in order to measure dishonesty, we, we use two different sets of measures. So first of all, in the survey, uh, we, we had a bunch of self-reported attitudes towards corrupt behavior, which we think are interesting, but probably not very reliable measures. And then we also used a classic measure uh, from behavioral economics, a die tossing game, where a person is asked to throw a die um, in private 30 times and report back how many sixes they got. And then they get paid for every six they report back. So it's clear that they have an incentive to lie about it to get more money. And it's really a test of whether they're willing to uh, lie for personal gain, knowing that, that this is measured, but they're not going to be caught for it. And they know they won't be caught for it because they're sitting in private doing it. Uh, so we cannot tell who lies at an individual level, but at a group level, we can tell who's lying or we can see that um, some people with certain characteristics tend to lie more than others. 
and cheat more than others. And in lots of different contexts across the world, this has been shown to uh, be a, um, a reliable measure of this honesty also in other arenas and has been found to be highly correlated with uh, corruption levels in countries. So that's our measure of this honesty. Um, then to look at the four mechanisms, we uh, use other games, dictator game and a trust game. I'm not going to go into details on this because of time, but we have it in the paper if anyone is interested. For a risk aversion, we use an investment game. Um, for political networks, uh, this is, of course, very difficult to measure. So we decide to go for a question in the survey about whether you have dynastic ties in the family with the thought that if women come in with weaker political networks, we should expect these networks, uh, the ones from political family to already have networks, um, while the ones without dynastic ties in the family to be the ones who come in really without political networks. And so we should expect much more of a change among those without dynastic ties. And then finally, of aspirations, uh, we asked um, whether the politicians had an interest in standing for office uh, again. And given Aram's presentation right now, I can mention that uh, the politicians uh, could choose where and when uh, they met with our survey team and they were not observed by family members when they were responding to the survey. So what we have here is a comparison uh, of about 200 uh, experienced and about 200 inexperienced politicians in, in local politics. Um, inexperienced meant that they were just elected. They had not yet taken office. We implemented this right after the election results were announced and before they took office. Um, the ones who were outgoing uh, experienced had been in power for five years. So first, let's look at the findings here for attitudes towards corrupt behavior elicited via the survey. So we, set, we asked a series of the net type examples. So for example, is it okay for a shopkeeper to offer a politician a small gift to help keep the tax auditor away? So across these questions, it was very clear that both that experienced politicians, both men and women, expressed a stronger distaste for corruption. But there was no significant difference between the attitudes expressed by women and men, neither among the inexperienced politicians nor the experienced ones. Then when we come to our die tossing game, um, uh, we see much more action. Um, let's see if you can see this. So what you see here is the distribution of how they responded. Now remember that um, if you throw a die, uh, sort of the, the um, theoretical distribution is that you should have an average of um, uh, five uh, sixes in 30 tosses. And so you should have a normal distribution around five. And we do see that a lot of people are in that region. But you can see that among the inexperienced, the women have a report fewer sixes uh, on average. And among the experienced, it's the women who report the most sixes. So we actually see that um, the experienced women have by far the highest reported number of sixes, uh, suggesting that they are the ones who are the most likely to be dishonest in this game for personal gain. Now, of course, we run this as multivariate models and control for a bunch of characteristics. And it holds that we see a large shift between inexperienced women who are less likely, they, have, they report fewer sixes than inexperienced men, and it goes up to experienced um, women who report um, a lot more sixes than both uh, inexperienced women and experienced men. How am I doing on time, Gabby? Um, we're just about at time, so if there's a way to, to wrap up in the next couple Oh, minutes. I'll wrap up. Sorry, I didn't, when I have full screen, I didn't see your message. Sorry. Okay. So on the uh, four mechanisms, uh, we have no evidence that female politicians are more pro-social uh, uh, across our measures. We do, however, see strong evidence. I'll jump to the, uh, make this a bit clear. Women enter office more risk averse, become way less risk averse over time. And we see that all the change in our data is driven by women from non-political families, suggesting that networks play, play a role. We do not see any uh, evidence of lower aspirations having an effect. So to conclude then, I'll just go through it quickly. We find a clear gender gap in dishonesty with women being less corrupt as they enter office and more corrupt than men as they exit office. I don't think this study is large enough to conclude whether we, this is really a shrinking gap or them becoming more 
um, corrupt, but we think that's certainly something we hope um, uh, we think is really important to study in future work. Um, we see evidence that change is due to lower risk aversion and stronger networks, although of course we cannot fully rule out the other potential mechanisms. Uh, and so our main takeaway here is that we should think about this as changing and dynamic and how it might change. And we should also, we believe, think about it as going beyond gender, that this is really about um, sort of the culture shock you uh, uh, experience as you enter politics, how different the political context is from your other life. So we might see similar patterns for other groups that are not so familiar with the political context they're entering into. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this truly, truly fascinating and, and slightly depressing results. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have we have time now for discussion. Um, and I think what I'll do is group together some of the questions that I've been seeing both in the chat and in the Q&A and maybe pose um, a couple of questions to each of the panelists um, and then um, uh, turn to each of you to, to respond to whichever questions you would like to speak to. Um, so why don't we start with Sorelli? Um, it's such an interesting project. And um, there's a question uh, from, from Jennifer um, asking you to maybe talk a little bit about what you see as the, as the next steps uh, for this really important research agenda. And if I may, I might add a question of my, of my own to that. Um, and again, I'll give questions to each of the panelists and then turn to you guys to, re to, to reply. Um, so, um, I'm wondering a little bit, one of the most interesting things you said was about um, work either working with existing community hierarchies or uh, working to transform existing power relationships. And I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit more, maybe give an example of some of the ways that you saw that. Um, so um, would you like to respond for a few minutes now and, or should I turn to the other? Why don't, why don't we give you the floor for a couple of minutes now while the questions are fresh and then we can turn to the other panelists. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for these questions. So I think um, I'll actually answer those together because um, that's that's definitely um, one of the tensions that we've been thinking a lot about. So to say a little bit further what we mean, um, there's this level of the community cadre within the, the bureaucracy where um, local women are recruited to actually be, you know, um, supporters of um, the self-help groups and their federations and they're called community resource persons and they have roles like bank linkage um, or um, livestock and agricultural extension support. Um, and, um, but what we found was that in our sample, um, these women, um, on the one hand, they were kind of in an ambiguous position because on the one hand, um, they were working, you know, 20 days a week and getting paid 10 days a week because um, any counter and, and there were some men too and it's because the salary the daily salary made a difference to them right so um, clearly they are um, kind of marginalized um, in some ways to be you know overworking but still like wanting to continue um, being employed as contract workers of the state. But at the same time, um, we found that they were already those that have existing social capital in the form generally of being from um, more privileged castes um, and um, their own families, their uh, women in their families, or um, sometimes the men there um, were already kind of in higher up positions in their local community. Um, so, so that tension of um, a program like L NRLM, which really speaks to kind of elevating the voices of the most marginalized and kind of um, putting information up the system in terms of the demands of the most marginalized women um, may not really be um, going through if these community resource persons are actually from the more elite segments of the local hierarchy. Um, and that's actually something we wanted to kind of understand a lot more in terms of whether there's variation and how the recruitment of these this cadre um, is done um, across different states or maybe even across different districts in the same state. Um, and so those are the kinds of you know structural questions to, to answer Jennifer's um, question um, that we're interested in, in thinking more about. Um, because for example, in um, some of Biju Rao's work on Jivika, um, uh, in Bihar, um, there, you know, he's really documented that they've really documented that, um, you know, a widow, for example, who was um, very much like shunned and marginalized in the local community actually was ended up being one of these community resource persons. 
um, in, in that program. And so the question really is, what conditions are allowing for um, that to happen? Is it because there's less, you know, more less bureaucratic overload in that context? Is it because it was smaller scale? Um, why why were basically more marginalized voices able to um, to become um, part of the the lower level? Thanks. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to see to see where this goes. Um, so Aaron, there are quite a few questions for you. I know you saw some of them already in the Q&A and chat, but I might sort of group a few of them together. Um, there were some questions. Um, Francisca had posed a question about social desirability bias. Um, is there something about sort of women feeling more or less pressure right on the spot to answer? And then a whole group of questions kind of from different people on different aspects, but kind of about sort of the variables upon which you were matching uh, women in the sample, um, thinking about the time of day of the interview, the location of the interview, um, family type, the gender, the enumerator. Um, so about a bunch of questions along those lines, but maybe telling us a little bit more about that matching and some of the other kind of um, different observables um, that you might think about in this or in future work. Um, and then a third set of questions that are sort of pushing to think about the broader implications. Um, so Tanushri had a really interesting question saying, okay, well, if women are not being observed in the, in the polling booth with the secret ballot, um, what does that suggest to you about kind of the quality of voting? Um, and similarly, Jennifer was asking sort of what are the broader implications for this as you think about voting and more public types of political participation? Um, yeah, so those are kind of the three the three sets that I saw going on in our in our many chats here. Um, but feel free to take uh, any of those that you would like to respond to. Okay, so I'm going to group these. Um, so remind me of the first ones. Um, what was sort of the, the, main the first one was about social desirability bias. Yes, social desirability. You know, it's um, it's it's a trade off, right? Because there's so many great. So for example, one of the things we I just presented this at uh, Midwest a few weeks ago, and one of the great comments I got was to incorporate some of Francesca's work on marriage age, um, but they don't always ask about marriage age, right? So you're, you're stuck in this dilemma where on the one hand, you have these three nationally representative 30,000 people surveys, um, but then within that you have subsections where only some of them have been um, asked about political opinions, right? So it's been really general, but then only a few of them go into the um, sort of the current affairs kind of stuff. So you're really sort of losing some of your sample. Um, that's not to say you can't do it. I just think that because these surveys aren't consistent over time, we've had to make some choices about what to include and what not to include. The, the process, the, the, the sort of criteria on which we've matched has been the same controls that we've used in our logit, right? So as best I can tell, this seems to be the gold standard for matching is that you basically take everything that would have gone into your regression and match it on the same criteria to, to make sure that the, the post-process sample is similar, except for the fact that you're being observed in one and you're not being observed in the other, right? And then within that, the logit's going to tell you how much each of those other criteria matter. So we're really doing this in a way that, you know, it's think about it in the sense that we haven't run an experiment here. We're using sort of off-the-shelf data and we're, we're trying to make some sense of it. I think going forward, it would be interesting to actually do this on an experimental basis. Um, but you can imagine that it's also not easy to ask people to leave, right? Or ask people to give women space. So so we, should we use sort of use the shoshara like the MP3 method or something else, right? So this is just kind of, a. I think this sort of feeds into the broader implications of this is to not try and undersell this project as being, you know, well, we've used second data, secondary data, and so we really can't say that much, is to say that this is an avenue that's ripe for investigation, right? We've been able to find these results just using what was available to, uh, to us through the NES and through CSES. But it's, it's really opened up an important question about how women express themselves in the household as political entities. I think the thing that I really want to emphasize here is that you know, the education interaction that I have at the end of the paper that shows that women with some education actually overcome this and are no less likely to answer questions differently if they're alone or if they're with their husband or whatever it is, that jump is really small, right? So it's like women with a secondary schooling education, right? Or women who are just literate. 
And so lots of women in India don't even have that. But it's very interesting to see that even with a small amount of education, these gaps can sort of be overcome, right? So we're not saying that women aren't interested in politics or they're being repressed by the family. It's just that this is something that's really interesting that just is a fact of life for a lot of women in India is that they face sort of taboos or pressures when it comes to answering surveys um, in the household. Um, and yes, definitely, I'm going to try and incorporate many of the um, many of the sort of other factors that we could like the time to take into completing the survey, if there are regional effects that we could exploit, that would be really interesting too. Um, so I, I really appreciate all the feedback and the comments. Amazing, thank you. Um, so Fran, there, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of questions on, on, on your amazing paper as well. Um, I've grouped them into three sets as far as, as, far as I can see them. Um, the first is um, thinking about whether there are dimensions here about related to partisanship. Um, so does level of dishonesty um, maybe vary by partisan affiliation? I, obviously, these are local elections, but in some places, like, for example, West Bengal, of course, where um, there, there is party affiliation in panchayat elections, is that something you could look at? That came from Tunisri and also um, a similar question from Bumi. A related question from Rachel, um, it's kind of picking up on the partisanship thing, is it does it matter how, how women are being recruited into local politics and does that sort of channel um, into more or less corrupt uh, types or, beha or behaviors? Um, so that was the first question, sort of thinking about um, recruitment and partisanship and whether that comes into play. Um, a second question came from Jennifer, um, which was sort of about intersectionality and whether you can look at this in, in, in interaction with other with other variables, for example, caste, um, thinking about um, uh, Elise and, and Rachel's excellent paper on, on caste and gender and intersectionality could be really interesting there. Um, and then a third set of questions, um, again, feel free to take up any or, or none of these, um, is I guess largely related to the mechanisms. Um, so Aram had a fascinating question asking, um, are you perhaps picking up the difference between um, sort of um, the, the successful local pol female local politicians and, and, the, and the honest ones? The implication being that the more honest you are, the less successful you'll be. Um, in, in local politics. And my own question was similar, sort of thinking about is one of the mechanisms possibly an emulation of male political culture? Um, this is something we see in our policing work, right? Female police officers try to be like meaner than the male officers because they're emulating the sort of bureaucratic norms and culture around them. Um, so could there be something going on, on there as well related to sort of the mechanisms why, why you see these effects over time? Those are great questions. So thank you to all. Um, let me start actually with that um, emulating male culture and the, the, what Aram has as a selection question really of whether this is picking up that women tend to be re-elected if, um, if they're less honest. We cannot fully control for that in the design we have. Um, uh, we have tried to control for it in different ways by looking at the different subgroups of whether the men and women were re-elected or not. Um, so in, in all the different subsets we have looked at, the results hold. Um, but I think it's worth um, drawing out and spelling out more clearly how we think we may or may not be around, able to get around that selection question. So I, I need to think about that a little harder. On the partisanship, almost all of these were Trinamul Congress um, because they really dominated those elections. Um, we don't have information, as far as I know, on how the women were recruited, but I have to look, go back and look at our survey instruments. That was something we thought about, but I actually really like that as an idea. On the intersectionality, we have a really re rich set of controls. We've tried to run um, the results with inter intersectional um, patterns. The problem then is that then we get really small sample sizes. So we start getting worried about whether we're just picking up noise. Um, we do include all these uh, characteristics as controls, though, and our results hold to all the controls we have. Um, but I do think there is something to be thought about in the last uh, point I made in the conclusion quite rapidly, is that this isn't necessarily just a gender thing. This might be a minority thing. It might be a, um, anyone who's not part of the main political game characteristic, that you start out being more risk averse, more, um, more different, and you become more similar. And as Gabby is saying, maybe you become even worse because you're trying to emulate that culture. Um, 
I'm not sure I think it is that depressing though, as you said, as I ended Gabby, because in some sense, um, we, we see in the data, and that's another paper we have, that the entering politicians are less uh, likely to um, report dishonestly than the normal citizens, really. so, so citizens in their area. And so in that sense, they're better than normal people. And so should we really expect women politicians to be better than normal people? Uh, maybe it's okay for women to just be normal human beings. So I'll end on that. That's great. And I might just, we have, I think we have just a tiny bit of time remaining, but there was another great question also for you, Sean, before you disappear, um, um, from, from Carol in the Q&A. Um, related to whether there's an independent resource base, right? Um, sort of thinking about um, if, if that makes a difference in terms of um, the ability to maybe hold out against the pressures of corruption for, for a longer time or not. Um, so an, another exciting thing to consider there. Um, great. So um, there are lots of questions in the Q&A, but I think, uh, Jennifer, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we're almost, we're almost at time. Um, so um, do, I think probably uh, the, the good news is for, for everyone who's put a question in the Q&A is all of the panelists will have access to those and be able to see those as we go on. Um, but this is just a really, really rich and exciting set of papers. I really enjoyed reading them and hearing about them um, and the sort of the attention that they're calling to, to uh, you know, um, political life of women uh, between and beyond elections, I think is really, really exciting. So thank you all. And a thank you to you, Gabby. Can you hear me okay, Gabby, before you disappear? <laughs> yes, yes, I can. Great, <laughs> thanks. Um, I, I just wanna thank all of the panelists today and Gabby for, for moderating a really fantastic set of papers. Uh, I think this was such a nice and appropriate way to end the workshop with this wide, sort of wide ranging discussion of the many ways in which women can engage in politics, but also um, upending some of our expectations and assumptions that, that need to be upended and leaving us a lot of room for future rich work on the varied ways in which women can do and, and perhaps should participate in politics. So thank you so much for um, offering your insights to all of you. And with that, we are finished with the first annual Indian politics workshop of the Center on Contemporary India. As you all know, the topic for this year was gender and politics in South Asia. And it's been a true privilege for me as someone who doesn't really do work in this area to learn so much from all of the work that's been discussed and the experiences of the practitioners who have also engaged with us over the last two days. Um, I, I encourage all of you to continue to um, look at what we might be offering from the center. I expect there'll be more activities in the next academic year, in addition to individual talks and broader large conferences. For those of you in the Bay Area, hopefully we'll be able to invite you to events in person sooner rather than later. And we look forward to inviting others to campus for events in the future as well. So thank you all of you for engaging with us over this period. And we, we truly look forward to working with you and um, learning about your work and hopefully engaging with you in work as we move forward. So thanks so much and please be in touch if you have any questions about what we're doing at the center or anything else with the Institute at Berkeley. Thank you. <laughs>